Okay, without further ado, I'd like to introduce William McCaskill. He's known to many of you as one of the progenitors of the effective altruism movement. He wrote the book, Doing Good Better, in 2015. He's an associate professor of philosophy at Oxford University. He was educated at Cambridge, Princeton, and Oxford. Now he's the president of the Center for Effective Altruism, founder of Giving What We Can and 80,000 Hours. Please warm, join me in a warm welcome to Professor William McCaskill. Hello, EA Global. Um, it's great to see you all here. Uh, yeah, when Amy and Tara first suggested how we were going to do EA Global this, um, this year, she, they were saying, well, it'll just be like a few kind of small events. And apparently 500 people is small now, so I guess I've got to get used to that. Um, so this talk's going to be about um, the theme, or kind of one of the themes of the conference, which is the intellectual explorations of uh, intellectual exploration within effective altruism. OK, I think the slides aren't working. Hey, no, now they are. OK, so it's about intellectual exploration and the kind of current state of EA and how those two things are related, where you know, the overarching theme of the three AA globals that we've had is the idea of doing good together, the idea that we can potentially have much larger impact if we think about doing good as a community rather than as just a collection of individual agents. And one of that things um, that implies is you know, really continuing to explore, because if you get new um, evidence, new insights, it's not just you that benefits, but it's actually the whole community. So I'll start off, as I usually do, by giving some updates over um, what's been happening in the main organizations over the last year. So Charity Science Health, organization that um, sends the Minder SMS messages um, to people in India to remind them to get immunizations. They've been doing super well. Um, got a second Give Well incubation grant of $350,000. That now means they're up to over half a million dollars. And you know, I say this every time I mention them, but I just really want to highlight how awesome Charity Science Health are in terms of the approach they took to founding a new organization of doing like, a complete literature review to look at what are the most you know, effective programs that we know of that, aren't, that don't yet have a nonprofit working on them. I mean, this is a really small number of organizations um, to my knowledge, have actually ever been founded using that approach. Life You Can Save, again, have a steady growth um, with respect to moving money. Last year moved about $2.7 million to global poverty charities, Give World Top recommended charities in particular, with um, probable 50, 40 to 50% growth um, this year, going up to hopefully about $4 million. So, you know, as we can see, the kind of charitable fundraising aspect of um, EA is still going very strong. Founders Pledge has approximately doubled the number of um, total pledges that it's been able to raise compared to the year before, where Founders Pledge, for those who don't know it, encourages um, found tech founders or other entrepreneurs to donate at least 2% of their profits upon exit um, to what the charity of their choosing. And so again, that's been going really strong, doubling over the last year. Um, animal charity evaluators, again, getting really significant growth and has now moved over $5.4 million to its top-rated charities, which is really pretty amazing given that the total amount of um, money moving into farm animal welfare um, just a few years ago was measured in you know, 10 to $20 million. Some other organization updates, um, more qualitative now. So Dot Impact, um, organization based in uh, Vancouver is rebranded as Rethink Charity. And that does kind of two things, incorporating local effective altruism network, um, so helping with local groups, and then also students for high impact charity, where that's trying to encourage high school students to engage with the ideas of effective altruism as part of their kind of educational curriculum. And so that's really exciting because it's not really something we've done before. Um, sentience politics. Um, became an independent organization, um, renaming itself as the Sentience Institute, doing research into fundamental questions related to improving the lives of animals um, and how to, improve, you know, how to do ad animal advocacy better. Um, then organization I'm involved in, the 
Oxford Global Priorities Institute. Started laying groundwork for that. That should come into existence um, in January. It's led by Professor Hilary Graves and Mich uh, Michelle Hutchison. Um, started its research agenda and started to get visiting academics um, into Oxford. And so that's really exciting because it's starting to make um, the ideas of effective altruism you know, more consolidated um, and better represented within academia, which you know, I think is going to be crucial going forward. So like I say, moving money is still like a big part of what EA is doing. But more and more, people have started to focus on uh, the use of our time. And that's you know, because we've been so successful at moving money, this is just becoming more and more important thing. And we're seeing more and more people moving away from earning to give and instead doing direct work. And that means that the kind of role of 80,000 hours becomes ever more important. And they've really had a kind of astonishing year. Um, and especially, you know, the last year they've started to really see kind of hockey stick growth. Um, I actually think this, you know, amazing development where they've really started to grow a lot correlates quite closely with me no longer being as involved, um, which I then take full credit for. Um, <laughs> like, if you're the consequentialist, one of the great things is that doesn't matter whether you're, you know, doesn't matter how you have the impact. If you, you're having a great impact by not being involved, that counts just as much. <laughs> um, so really, this is this is all me by, by getting out of the way. Um, so 80,000 Hours did a bunch of things. Launched the 80,000 Hours paperback, um, so you can buy that on um, Amazon. Um, putting all the career guide. This is years of research now into one, um, into one form had over 1.5 million readers on its site in the last year. It's now the most um, heavily trafficked website um, in the EA community, um, kind of overtaking GiveWell. Um, also launched the 80,000 Hours podcast, um, which I just really love. I listen to it like as soon as they come out. Um, if you want to learn more about it, Rob's in the audience. Um, and that's really great as well for like, um, if you don't listen to it, getting kind of up to speed on just like the latest thinking within, 80, within the EA community, because often there's a kind of de delay in terms of stuff coming out in written content, but this just means you can just get it straight from the horse's mouth, like from open, open philanthropy program offices and so on. Um, and then in terms of its growth, of its main metric, over a thousand significant plan changes. Um, that's 10x growth compared to just a few years ago. So, you know, that's been um, really exciting development and I think does represent the importance of people doing direct work compared to just donating. Um, in terms of uh, the organization I'm, I have been most closely associated with, Center for the Effective Altruism, um, I told you about my amazing trick towards to getting uh, growth for 80,000 hours, I'm planning to do the same for Center for the Effective Altruism. So Tara has moved into the role of uh, CEO, um, replacing me with uh, me moving into more of a kind of figurehead role as president. Um, and I expect it to go you know, leaps and bounds compared to where it was before um, as a result. Uh, we've, again, been doing a ton of um, stuff over the last year, a lot of different projects, the role of the centers to really act as a springboard for the EA community. Been doing that through EAG conferences this year. This is the last major one in London um, and a bunch of smaller EAGX events um, around the world. Uh, you know, giving what we can is again, like, had uh, similar growth to the other, organiza um, other organizations, up about 50% from this time last year, past the milestone of over $1.5 billion of lifetime pledges, um, which is pretty cool. Uh, we also launched the EA funds, again, as a way of kind of representing uh, to people and giving people opportunities to donate really effectively, you know, outside of uh, traditional uh, areas. You know, people often say, Donations are really important, but can struggle to know where to point people other than to give well or maybe animal charity evaluators, whereas the EA funds allow you to donate really effectively within global poverty, animal welfare, um, reduction of uh, existential risk or long-run future, and EA community building as well. Um, and we had really good response of that, of $2 million um, moved through it since March. And then finally, the EA grants program as well, which um, I announced just about six months ago at Boston, but we've already had a really great response for that. I mean, just, we had 739 applicants um, for the first round, uh, which is you know, far more than I was expecting and also just of really high quality as well. So we were able to distribute the whole 500,000 pounds that we'd allocated for it, and we hope to make this you know, a really core part of what we're doing into the future. 
In terms of other side of the pond, we've then got um, GiveWell. Um, added in terms of its research, we're able to add three more top charities um, and one standout charity. So the top charities being NFund, Malaria Consortium, and Site Savers, and the standout charity being Helen Keller International's Vitamin A program. So moving into micronutrient fortification. Um, moved estimated $91.6 million to top charities. That's about the same as it moved last year. Um, it's unclear whether that represents kind of slowing growth in the amount of money moved to give well charities, or if it's just noise. Um, you know, the previous year they'd grown 200% compared to the year before, which was like unusually strong and driven by a small number of very large donors. So possibly that's just regression to the mean. Um, but, you know, either way, absolutely f huge amount of money that GiveWell is still continuing to move. Um, but one thing that's certainly happening is that incubation grants are starting to become a bigger and bigger part of what GiveWell are doing. The reason being, they've got, they feel like they've got a really pretty good grasp on the landscape. Um, over the last 12 months, it gave over $180 million in separate grants. Um, and I think a lot of people can't, you know, maybe don't realize just how much money open philanthropy is moving now. Because, um, you know, twice as much as GiveWell, because it's not always as well, ad, um, you know, as kind of highly publicized or as relevant necessarily to individual donors. Um, but they've made a number of big grants. So again, familiar grants to GiveWell top charities, AMF and SCI. Um, but then also progressively grants outside of that into more, much more speculative areas. So Target Malaria, working on gene drives that has the potential um, at least to give us the ability to completely eradicate malaria um, for the very low cost. Um, John Hopkins Center for Health Security was another big grant, showing them really moving into um, biosecurity and pandemic preparedness. Um, and $30 million over three years to open AI, um, you know, really representing how seriously they're taking um, the importance of developing AI that's safe and beneficial for everyone rather than risky. So, you know, the big theme here is just how much it's been ramping up its funding of areas outside of global health and development. Um, it also launched the Open Philanthropy Project AI Fellows Pro Program. That might be of interest to a number of people in the room, again, because they're really concerned by AI safety and wanting to promote more people who are thinking very sensibly and critical, critically and responsibly about the issues of AI development, um, in which case you can now get funding for PhD students if you're a PhD student in AI or machine learning and want to work um, within the realm of technical AI safety. So with respect to them kind of moving outside of just the areas of global health and development, I mean, here's a graph that kind of represents um, their funding. So the green is still global health and development. Um, so it's still representing, you know, the plurality of what they're doing, like a third of their funding. But over time, it's just, there's been increasing and increasing attention on um, biosecurity, farm animal welfare, um, AI, and other areas of uh, global catastrophic risks as well, such as um, risks from extreme climate change, um, geomagnetic magnetic storms, and so on. Um, and that's, I, I suspect, just going to kind of continue and continue in the future, where um, as Open Philanthropy's grant making continues into the high hundreds of millions, um, I suspect its focus on global catastrophic risks and farm animal welfare will increase even more compared to before. So I've been talking a lot about kind of inputs, you know, numbers of money moved. Obviously, we don't really care about money moved. That's not what we care about. What we care about is actually having an impact. Um, and most of the time, you know, as EAs, we're trying to think about um, just, you know, how can we do the most good? And this is a kind of forward-looking thing. We don't often look back in terms of thinking, well, what have we actually achieved so far? Um, but I think it's worth doing that at least sometimes, and EA Global's as good a time as ever. And so kind of, um, you know, bringing this together, let's look at the kind of major cause areas and see what's happened. So just looking at one of GiveWell's top charities against Malaria Foundation, as a result of its funding, the overwhelming majority of which comes from um, EA community or as a result of EA organizations, it's now um, received enough funding just this year to protect 43 million children um, from malaria. So, you know, I come from Scotland that has a population of 5 million. Um, in a single year, AMF is going to protect eight times the population of my home country, um, entirely as a result of the funding that um, has come through GiveWell and the EA community. 
Um, so it's really pretty hard to appreciate kind of just how big those numbers are. Um, but thinking about eight population of Scotland eight times over kind of helps me just appreciate that. Um, corporate campaigns are the huge success story, it seems. Um, because the field of you know, farm animal welfare advocacy was so neglected, I think we just really didn't know just how much you could achieve with a small amount of money um, before you know, we really started investigating this. So this is something that, again, has come from you know, organizations that uh, organizations like ACE have been championing, Mercy for Animals and so on. Um, and for those who don't know, the idea is you just go to the big retailers, point out um, the conditions of um, factory farm chicken, layer hens in their um, supply chain, and say, hey, you should really change this. And if they say no, they say, well, you should really change this. Maybe we'll have a campaign to tell the public about the sort of conditions that the eggs that they're eating in come from. And it's been enormously successful with all the major, all the top 50 retailers and um, uh, fast food chains in the US now signed on, and this is really going global. Um, and already it seems like these campaigns have spared 225 million hens per year from cages. Um, and that's only going to increase in the future um, and is from a base of a very small amount of money, just um, a, few million, a few million dollars. Then the final development is much more qualitative. It's much harder to measure kind of what sort of impact um, uh, this is having in kind of concrete terms. But certainly kind of concern for the safe development of AI just looks so radically different now compared to it did, how it did five years ago, which was moving from this totally fringe issue that only kooks were really talking about um, to now something that's become a mainstream and respectable issue in the field. Where, um, so I was at the Asilomar conference, which is kind of successor to Puerto Rico, had most of the industry leaders kind of in the room, and even the skeptics, um, even the people who the media portrays as saying, well, they think all the AI safety stuff is overblown, they still say, like, well, I don't think it's the biggest priority, but of course I think it's a good thing to do. And so that's now the level of um, discussion, um, and that's extremely surprising for those people who've been concerned about this for many years. It's really kind of a pretty amazing progress. Um, so it seems like we, you know, uh, you know, we've really had some big wins, but obviously, we, you know, we don't want to get complacent. But what we should do is think about, um, you know, how did this happen? Um, what was it that was like, you know, when we kind of go back, not just in the causal chain of like, well, we managed to move this money, but what was the kind of key distinctive thing that EA was adding? Um, and I think it was probably, um, you know, like I say, I think we've probably been making a lot more progress than I expected. Um, and like I say, we should be thinking about kind of why that is. Um, what was the kind of key underlying idea? Um, and I think that one potential answer, not the only answer, but I think one we should think about is, <laughs> I think you're just never going to find out. I'm just going to have to, <laughs> just going to have to end the talk here. Weirdo saying two things. <laughs> um, and to illustrate this, here is one, one weirdo. Um, in, when I was in the Bay, I used Eliezer Yukowski as the example, but, you know, we have many weirdos to choose from. <laughs> My favorite thing about this picture is that it's like Boston is the existential risk. Um, he looks like, remarkably like Agent Smith from The Matrix. I also don't want to say that, you know, it's only people in existential risk who are um, in the weirdos category. Here's Toby, another weirdo. This is from when he got tons of attention in the BBC um, for his pledge to give away um, most of what he earns. Um, you, it might be kind of hard to see from the photo, but the BBC got, to illustrate the idea of you know, giving a substantial proportion of your income, they got him to just throw money into the air, <laughs> um, which I really think is the, the perfect uh, metaphor for effective giving. <laughs> um, certainly, certainly that's how the you know, the BBC understands it. <laughs> um, but then my favorite of all, in terms of photos making um, people look um, dumb, is <laughs> Peter Singer. But the thing, um, so you know, representing, obviously representing his views on um, the importance of 
uh, preventing animals from being in factory farms, other than any of his uh, other arguments he's made about uh, non-human animals. Uh, but my favorite thing about this is that this isn't just an isolated photo. Over and over again, <laughs> there seem to be these photos of Peter Singer cuddling farm animals. <laughs> but not only farm animals. My favorite of these overall <laughs> is Peter cradling carrots like a baby. And I would pay so much money to know what was going through his mind at this time. <laughs> when he's thinking, you know, because he's very mild-mannered, like he really is, you know, what you imagine a, a kind of mild-mannered philosopher to be. And he's probably thinking, you know, I'm one of the great philosophical minds of my generation. <laughs> but if this is the way to do the most good, I guess I'll, <laughs> I guess I'll, I'll hug the carrots. Um, Okay, there is, I think there's a deeper point to what I'm saying. Um, and that point is the importance of con kind of continuing to explore. So I do think it's the case that EAS had some real successes, certainly compared to how I was thinking about things, um, you know, back in 2009 when, you know, giving what we can, had 23 members, it was me and Toby working part-time. He once suggested that maybe we'd want to hire someone part-time. And I was like, that's just insane. It's never going to happen. Um, so things have gotten like a lot bigger since then, and there might be a temptation when you have, you know, um, greater success than you were expecting to really double down on those successes and then just say, okay, well, we're having big wins within global poverty, farm and welfare, um, and global catastrophic risk, so let's just really keep doubling down. And I think that would be a mistake. Um, uh, I mean, at the work, kind of, you know, worst situation, um, you get kind of everyone just thinking, well, what's the best thing for me optimally to do? Well, it's this cause area. What's the best thing within that cause area? Okay. And everyone makes the kind of same decision. And then you aim with, end up with like a thousand shitty AI researchers. Um, and that's like not what we want from like an optimal community. Um, uh, instead, we want to promote like a diversity of approaches, a diversity of ideas. Um, even in cases where you think, well, maybe this isn't the most important thing, but it's really underexplored. And there's huge gains. Um, in terms of value of information for the whole community to be able to explore those ideas. And that's what this conference is going to focus on most. Um, and yeah, so another way of putting this is that EA is a question. It's not an ideology. It's the question is about how can you do the most good? And we have these like tentative answers, but that's what they are. In the same way as within science, you know, what is the scientific method? It's not a bo body of knowledge. It's not a body of facts. Um, instead, it's like a methodology. It's an approach for trying to sort truth from falsehood. Similarly, effective altruism is about trying to take that scientific mindset and use it to answer the question of how we can do the most good. Um, and we'd lose a lot of value if we turn effective altruism into a set of answers rather than um, uh, rather into this question and this mindset and this methodology. So how does that relate to the conference today? Um, I think the key, so the conference today is about, and tomorrow is about, um, uh, you know, EA as a community, thinking how can we have the biggest impact as, you know, as a community as possible, but then with a particular focus on the importance of intellectual exploration um, uh, in order to um, increase that kind of community impact, where the idea is, you know, you discover new insight, and that will ripple across, like, the entirety of the community. Um, okay, I'm going to give up on this now. Um, that will ripple across the entirety of the community. And so, um, you know, in the course of this conference, I think, you know, again, like kind of echoing what Rox said, it can be very easy to think like, oh, well, like I'm into global poverty, so I'm going to talk to all the poverty people, or I'm into farming and welfare, so I'm going to talk to all the animal welfare people. Um, but I think like the most important thing, or like one of the most valuable things from this conference, is um, the ability to kind of learn new things. And one thing that, you know, this community really tries to do is to foster the kind of virtue of changing your mind. Where, you know, so often people can get into this mentality where they're like, this is my beliefs, especially when it comes to kind of moral matters. This is my beliefs, and so I'm going to stand by that. And what's what kind of epistemic virtue is. Whereas that's, you know, the opposite of what we want to try to promote. If you change your mind, that's huge. If you're in an argument with someone and you're the person that changes your mind, you're, you've won in an important sense. It's not, that's not losing the argument. 
And so during the course of this conference, think, you know, I think the aim should be like, can you change your mind in the course of this conference? Whether that means just, you know, maybe that doesn't mean a kind of flat out change of beliefs. Maybe it just means something, argument that you want to think a lot more about that you hadn't really appreciated. Maybe that just means becoming more confident or less confident in a certain opinion you had. But certainly um, going to um, those talks that you don't know much about, trying to talk with people who have very different perspectives of you, than you, trying to get the, to the kind of, you know, bottom, if you can, of those disagreements and try and figure out, um, you know, how can you try and improve your view? Um, and I think it's only, you know, if we do that, only if EA, um, if we kind of keep that open-mindedness, keep that idea that EA is a question, not an ideology, only if we do that can we, um, you know, really achieve um, all that we hope to do so um, as a community and a movement. Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.